All right. Welcome to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. So I see uh, we do have a couple people who are going to be uh, filing down on this very overclass and s overcast and slightly rainy day. So first of all, I want to welcome you all here on site and l just let you know we are live streaming this on YouTube and Twitch. So if you're ever, you know, sick in bed at home or wondering what to do on a Saturday night but don't want to make the drive out, you can always join us there and say hi. In addition, you can check us out on our website, uacnj.org. That's where you're going to find a list of all our upcoming presentations, information about uh, our goal here as a nonprofit to bring astronomy and science to everyone we possibly can with our free public programs and outreach. Uh, in addition, uh, you'll find out information about what type of telescopes we have and also information on our member clubs because we do like to hook people up with their local astronomy clubs whenever possible. So, you can also check us out on... Stepping away from the uh, speaker so I don't get the feedback. Um, you can also check us out on our socials. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that's where you're going to find out if we have any upcoming events or possible changes, uh, such as if suddenly it's uh, raining sideways. That being said, for those people who are here, uh, we do have a brief safety briefing. If you need to use the potty, it is the porta potty in back. To my left, your right, we also have a little uh, museum and gift shop area that you can check out. I think I have someone in there manning it right now, unless they got run over. I don't know. There was a kerfuffle in the parking lot. Uh, speaking of being run over, we are using our headlights when. Please bear with us during our technical issues. Do uh, monitor online traffic if you're flying when you get back. Hello? Aha, we're back. I have to run farther away from the speaker, apparently. It does not like me. Uh, so thank you for bearing with us during that. Uh, so back to where I was. Uh, museum and gift shop area, you can check out. Uh, all of us are here are volunteers, so if you see uh, someone with a name tag, uh, feel free to ask them questions. We'd more than love to answer them. Uh, and we were on getting not getting run over. We are using our headlights when we leave here because we like to avoid getting run over. That's where we were. The uh, clicking de derailed my train of thought. Um, that be although if you do have a flashlight, do keep that pointed towards the ground just so we don't uh, add any additional chances of blinding. And with that, we're going to get into tonight's presentation, which is the life cycle or the life and death of stars. Uh, with and presenting tonight is Walt. Walt has been interested in astronomy since he saw the Pleiades as a Boy Scout. He bought his first telescope in 1985, just in time to see Halley's Comet. Walt is a member of the North Jersey Astronomical Group and the Rockland Astronomy Club, and he's been volunteering here at Jinjum for over 20 years. And with that, we're going to give this to Walt. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> Mark Twain saw how Halley's Comet appeared when Mark Twain was born, and it appeared one more time uh, the year he died. So he saw it twice. Not many, uh, probably didn't see it the first time, but he was on the Earth for two appearances. As Kim said, I'm going to be talking about the life and death of stars. I'm going to talk a, a, a lot about how they're formed and also the objects that they leave behind after they die because they're really interesting objects. And so we're going to spend uh, some time looking at those as well. But first, I want to just go over a few uh, astronomy terms so you can be a professional amateur astronomer and, uh, and sound impressive out there. 
So the first thing we want to talk about is magnitude. Magnitude is the brightness of a star. And uh, there's apparent or visible magnitude, and then there's also absolute ma magnitude. This kind of illustrates the difference between the two. If car A and car B had identical brightness in their headlights, but car B was further away, those headlights would look dimmer. That would be apparent magnitude, and that's what we do with stars. Apparent magnitude is very important because as astronomers, when we try to identify stars, we look for how bright they are in the sky. And before we had all these GPS telescopes and point-and-shoot telescopes, uh, astronomers had to hop from the brightest star to a dimmer star to a dimmer star to find the objects that they were looking at. So apparent magnitude is very important for people who are doing visual astronomy and, and also photographic astronomy. Now absolute magnitude is trying to equalize the stars for how, they are, how bright they are absolutely. For example, if this truck had really bright headlights and this car not quite as bright, and they're at the exact same distance, the truck would have a higher absolute magnitude headlight than the car because it's absolutely brighter. It's giving out more light. It's not just apparent. So what we do is we, we try to standardize the brightness of stars at 10 parsecs, which is about 32.6 light years. So when you see an absolute magnitude of a star, it's how bright it would be at a distance of 10 parsecs. For planet, for planets, they're equalized at one astronomical unit. And one astronomical unit is defined as the distance from the Earth from the Sun. So about 93 million miles. How bright would that planet look if you're looking at absolute magnitude? And absolute magnitude is really important for doing science. Um, we know if two stars are next to each other and we know which one would be brighter, uh, we can also tell by how much. And more importantly, we can get the star spectrum, uh, and it gives important clues to the size of the star as well and other characteristics like what it's what it's made up of. Here's a list of some common stars with, with their magnitudes. Um, the designation of first magnitude goes way back to ancient time. Uh, Hipparchus um, first came out with a star of first magnitude is the brightest star in the sky and then a star of the second magnitude would be the second. So it's a very ancient classification system. And to adapt it to what we have discovered, we've had to go beyond the first magnitude. So Betelgeuse, which is a star up in Orion, is close to first magnitude. It's, we, we give it a 0.8. And the lower the number, the brighter the star. Remember, first magnitude is the brightest, second. The higher the number, the dimmer the star. So we see the full moon is negative 12.5 and our sun is negative 26. Venus at its brightest is negative 4. Sirius, negative 1.5. Your eye can see to about magnitude 6.5, give or take. Old eyes like mine, probably 6. Uh, under clear, dark skies. So that's about the limit. With binoculars, you can, you can go up a couple of uh, notches as well. The new James Webb. Uh, can see down to a 36th magnitude star, which is amazing. Now, even though we can see dim objects with our eyes, our eyes act like a camera with a 1 30th shutter speed. So we don't see the color that we see in photographs, even for objects that we can see. If we look at the Orion Nebula, even through a telescope, our eyes don't gather enough light to see the color. So we'll see like a foggy patch. The Hubble will take a picture for minutes or hours, sometimes days, in deep field. And that's how you get those beautiful colors. And our eyes just can't gather enough of that light. So that's OK. <laughs> uh, Everyone's excited about a so random that's rainbow. <laughs> Might be the coolest thing we see tonight. <laughs> Another concept uh, I'd like to talk about is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And the electromagnetic spectrum covers everything from radio waves to gamma waves. And we only see a small part of that spectrum. This little rainbow right here, that's the visible spectrum that we can see with our eyes. And so there's so much more energy, both 
below and above it that we just can't see. But we can put instruments on telescopes that are sensitive to these wavelengths, and so we can take pictures of stuff that we just can't see. And then we can color code it and, again, make beautiful pictures of structures that we just don't see. Uh, the James Webb Telescope, which I'll be talking about next month, uh, is near infrared. Almost all the work that it's doing is going to be in the near infrared. So it's looking right here. And its instruments can really cut through the dust and, and, uh, and debris because they're looking at near infrared. The Hubble did most of its work in visible light. It also had a near infrared camera as well. And so we're going to get a lot more information from the James Webb Telescope, it's, it's thought. We used the, our observations with the Hubble to kind of figure out what did we wanted to look at with the James Webb. Okay, we're get starting to get a little bit about stars. Now, what does that look at like to you? Anyone? Nothing, right? It's just a bunch of random dots on a piece of paper. It doesn't look like there's any relationship between the dots. They're just random. But when we see patterns appear on a graph, we see that there must be some kind of a, a relationship. So here we, we can definitely see some patterns. We, can, we see some correlation here. And uh, this is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Um, those two gentlemen decided to plot the stars based on their absolute magnitude and their spectral cl class, how bright they are and how hot. And hotness goes from blue is the hottest down to orange. And we'll, we'll see that uh, in even more detail in a minute. So it's plotted against their, their temperature. And we see that there's some common characteristics arise. It's kind of like a periodic table of elements where elements that are grouped together have similar characteristics. It's the same thing here on, on this HR diagram. The only difference is it's not static. A star spends about 90, 95% of its life on what they call the main sequence. But once it runs out of hydrogen to burn, then its plot changes, usually up to giants or supergiants, and then it falls down into white dwarfs, as, as we're going we're gonna to see that uh, a little more detail. But from any location on the graph, we can tell the luminosity, the spectral type, the color, the temperature, the mass, the chemical composition, the age, and the evolution, evolutionary history of that star. So this was a, a, a really great breakthrough. But it's pretty boring. It reminds me of a dot matrix printer I used to have. So here's, a, here's added a little color to it. And again, it's the exact same information, but we start to see uh, the color, the, the spectral type represented in a color. We see our si sun sitting right there in the main sequence. Um, the sun is considered one luminosity and, spec and, uh, and one on the temperature. Um, so other stars are, are measured against our sun kind of heliocentric of us, but this is a simple graph of the mass of a star versus its lifespan. And mass, again, we, we, we uh, weigh in solar masses, so the sun is one solar mass. And we can see a, a star the size of our sun will live about 10 billion years and a spectral type G2. Now, as stars get bigger, when you get up to 60 solar masses, those burn hot and fast, and they live short lives. So that three million year for their for that life on the on the hottest stars, hottest largest stars. And on the other end, one tenth of a solar mass, you get the uh, the brown dwarfs, which we think live trillions of years. But since the universe isn't trillions of years old, you know it's a it's conjecture. But they certainly are are burning very very slowly. It's like Jupiter on a slow sizzle is, is what a brown dwarf is. Here's another with size added. So we could see the hotter the star generally, the brighter it is. The bigger the star, the brighter it is. But you can have some bright, cool stars just because they're so huge. 
Like Betelge Betelgeuse is a, is a very cool star. It's a red giant. It's already it's off the main sequence. It's it's living its its death throes, but because it's so big, it's still really bright in the in the sky. And if Betelgeuse was in the place of our sun, uh, we would be inside it. So it's it's just huge. It would be coming up to uh, up to Mars. And then here's one more with some size put in there. Uh, again, Hertzsprung and Russell diagram. This is my favorite. Our sun is sitting right here, one solar mass, uh, w bright in the surface temperature of, of one. And uh, all these, all these uh, stars on the main sequence are, have reached what they call hydrostatic equilibrium. So when a star is born, a gas cloud compresses and then gravity starts to take over and they get smaller and smaller until it gets hot enough for a nuclear fusion. And that's a, a protostar. It finally bursts into, into life and after uh, 100,000 years or so of being a protostar, the outward pressure from the nuclear fusion equalizes or balances out with the gravity and that's where it, it reaches hydrostatic equilibrium. And it just stays at rest, if, if you will. For a huge atomic bomb, it's hard to say it's at rest, but it stays that size, in, our, in the sun's case, for 10 billion years until it reaches the end of its hydrogen supply. And as, as you saw, the bigger ones run out of hydrogen quicker and, uh, and start to move off this, this main sequence faster. Let's take a look at, at some of these uh, stars just to put them in, into perspective. Now, this isn't a star. This is the planet Jupiter. But I wanted to start with Jupiter. This is a picture back from 1994 when comet Schumacher-Levy struck Jupiter and left these, these plumes behind, these scars on Jupiter that lasted for a while. It's a pretty exciting time for astronomers. But the reason I'm showing you this is just to give you an idea of scale because each of these little dots it's about the size of the Earth. So if we start out with an earth size scar, it shows basically the relative size to Jupiter, which again also is not a star, it's another planet. But it gives you an idea. A white dwarf, which is what our sun will turn into, is about the size of the Earth. So this is not only the size of the Earth, but it's also the size of a white dwarf. Now here's the size of our sun. It just uh, the Earth is about a little less than eight thousand miles in diameter. Uh, Jupiter is eighty-six thousand miles in diameter. The sun is eighty eight hundred and sixty-four thousand, so ten times the size of Jupiter. And although it's ten times the diameter, about a thousand Jupiters can fit into the sun. But take a look at the sun and how it compares to Sirius, Pollux, and Arcturus. Arcturus is, is huge. It's about 21.9 million miles. And that's an easy star to find. If you're looking in the sky, even tonight, and you see the Big Dipper, you know how the handle curves? Well, they say follow the arc to Arcturus. So you arc the handle, and the next bright star you're going to see, it's going to be a reddish star and it'll be Arcturus in the constellation Booties. It's a very easy star to see. And as you can see, it's a, it's a huge star. But is it? Whoa, here's Arcturus now. He's not looking uh, as big as he did a little while ago. Um, next to Betelgeuse, Arcturus looks very tiny. Arcturus, uh, Betelgeuse is a, is a red giant, and as I've already said, would engulf Earth if it was where our, our sun is, as the sun is going to engulf us when it turns into a, a red giant in another five, five and a half billion years. Uh, probably the insurance companies will stop insuring our houses at that point. Um, Be Betelgeuse is also called Alpha Orionis. The way, they, the way scientists name stars is the brightest star 
gets the first letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha, and then it goes alpha, beta, gamma, all the way down the Greek alphabet. So you can tell just by the scientific name of a star what constellation it's in, Orion for Betelgeuse, and where it falls in in the, in the pecking order of, of brightness in that constellation. So it's the brightest star in, in Orion. It's the ninth brightest star in the sky, and it's part of the winter triangle. When you look up, you, you will see the winter triangle. Uh, Procyon and Sirius are the two other stars that form the, uh, the winter triangle. Uh, later tonight, if the clouds uh, help us out, you can see the summer triangle. <coughs> and Vega will be right directly overhead, and there's Altair and Deneb. <coughs> so it's a real, it's not a constellation, it's called an asterism because it's a shape in the sky, but it's not an official constellation. It actually covers a couple of constellations. But look for the big summer triangle if, if we get some, some uh, good cloud coverage leaving us. The red supergiant, Antares, is 604 light years from Earth, and it's 700 times the Earth's diameter. But its ov overall density is only a millionth of the sun. So it's a lot less dense because what happens is as these stars die, the gas, the gravity is not, not holding them tight anymore, and they just expand out. And so it's, it's like a, a really thin gas cloud. It's almost like going through a, a cloud, except you still get burnt pretty bad if you go through it. Um, and that's Alpha Scorpius. It's in Scorpius, and it's the brightest star in that. Uh, it's the heart of Scorpia, Scorpius, and you can see that. When you stand at that shed and you look that way, you'll, you're actually looking right into the center of our galaxy, and, uh, and Scorpius is there as well as uh, Sagittarius. That's the 15th brightest star in the st sky. Um, its exact size is uncertain, but we're certain that it's bigger than Betelgeuse. And finally, we got this big fella here, W. Cephi. He's one of the biggest well i don't really know if it's a he but it's a it's the one of the largest known stars to us uh the size is uncertain it's estimated at uh somewhere between 1050 and 1900 solar radii its photosphere which is the outer shell where where it radiates heat from uh that would reach almost to saturn if it were sitting there where our, where our sun is it's about 5000 light years from us so that's quite a range. I mean, that little tiny dot on Jupiter, that's the Earth, uh, is, is a, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a pixel on this screen when you're looking at these super giant stars. So a star's position on the HR diagram shows um, where it is in its lifespan as well. The evolution of our sun will move through the HR diagram in, in a very specific way. And uh, as, as I've noted, the dust cloud collapses until gravity takes over. It heats up. It lights up when it reaches hydrostatic equilibrium. It spends most of its time for the sun right here, 10 billion, about t just under 10 billion years sitting there in the, in the main uh, sequence. And... Uh, it's been on the main sequence about 4.6 billion years so far. So as I said, about four and a half, five and a half billion years left in its lifetime. And every second, uh, 600 million tons of matter are converted into neutrinos and solar radiation and an awful lot of, of energy. I mean, it's, it's just unimaginable. And this is just a very typical boring star. It's not even one of the hot stars. Um, Again, the precise position on the main sequence depends on the mass of hydrogen in the star and the core temperature. Um, and they can be as high as 107 uh, K, which is how they measure star temperature. It's about 192,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes yesterday seem like a cakewalk as far as heat. Um, but as it burns the hydrogen, helium starts to form in the core. And the core shrinks as hydrogen is converted to helium. When it runs out of hydrogen, the star leaves the main sequence and starts to become a, a subgiant. 
a so it, it become it starts to grow by this time it's so hot that there's there's no life on the earth left maybe cockroaches but other than that no no life on the earth becomes a a, a subgiant a red giant a helium burning star and then there's a helium flash and uh it it uh the shell comes off as a planetary nebula and what's left is a is a white dwarf so the white dwarf is about half the uh will be half the the mass of the sun and it will no longer be uh uh burning hydrogen or helium and and matter of fact it, it goes through oxygen as well and and, uh, and carbon before it gets to the helium flash so over the next 20 million years, the sun will become un unstable after burning that hydrogen, eventually throw off half its mass into what's known as a planetary nebula. So that's the shell of the star, just becomes a gas ring around the star. And uh, the remnant will become a white dwarf and cool for a few trillion years. In 10 to 20,000 years after it throws off that planetary nebula, that nebula will dissipate and all that's left will be the, uh, the white dwarf. And that's depicted here as the sun will move to sub giant red giant becomes a helium burning star also forms uh, carbon and oxygen becomes a red giant will will be inside the star at the time inside the sun at this point and then finally uh, gravity loses out and half of the mass just drifts out into a planetary nebula the white dwarf initially becomes a little hotter and then it cools and it just gradually over billions of years uh, cools off and will be found there on the chart and again this is just a chart so obviously it's not physically moving but we we plot the effects and where it is in its evolution that way but those those planetary nebulas are are very beautiful objects this is a planetary nebula the white dwarf is right in there this is the ring nebula and uh, we we're talking about the summer triangle um, this is is right near one of those stars right near Vega and it'd be directly above our head sometimes when we have good weather uh, we'll put a scope on it and it looks like a little smoke ring floating in the sky very cool it's 15th magnitude so you got to use a, a the, the, the middle star is 15th magnitude but the smoke ring is a, is a bit brighter and it's it's lit up by that star by the radiation of that white dwarf cooling off and as I said that white dwarf is the size of earth it's about the size of a planet sometimes a little larger depending on the size of the uh, the this the, the, the um the star initially and you see different colors there the blue color is helium uh, the cyan color um, is hydrogen and oxygen and the reddish color is nitrogen and sulfur so by looking at these colors, you can tell what elements you're, you're looking at as well. The ring is about one light year wide. That means it takes the light, it takes light one year to cross from one side to the other. So that's, that's a pretty large. When you, when you figure that light from our sun gets here in eight minutes, for light to take a year to travel across an object, that's a big object. I remember I spoke about the different wavelengths that we can observe by putting different instruments on the telescopes. Well, if we add some near infrared to this image, this is visual, by the way, this is taken by Hubble in visual light. We see a whole lot more there. Um, you can almost feel the shock wave emanating from that from that nebula. And that that shock wave uh, is about 10,000 to 100,000 years before it blew off its shell that we now call the the ring nebula so it swelled up about you know thousands of years be before it blew off its its entire shell and we can still see the remnants in infrared which is measuring heat we can still see that as as part of the picture um so this this photo, to, to make this photo, we use the Hubble telescope for visual, um, what's called the Large Binocular Telescope in Hawaii, and the Subaru Telescope in Hawaii, Hawaii for the H-alpha red. 
and they combined three images at three different spectrums to make this, this one picture and to give us the information that, that we have all in one. Here's another. I'm, I'm not going to, I've done this talk where I've spent a lot of time on, on these. I'm not going to spend as much time because I want to get spend a little more time on black holes and stuff. Um, but this is the Dumbbell Nebula in Volpeca. Again, it's it's an uh, easy object to see in a telescope. It's about 1,200 years from us, and it was first described by Charles Messier in 1764. So we've known about it for quite a while. Messier created this cal catalog called the Messier Catalog, and uh, you'll see objects designated with an M number. And to Messier, he was a comet hunter. hunter. So these were just annoyances. He kept saying, oh, is that a comet? And watch it for a couple days and realize, no, that's not a comet. So he decided to catalog all these things so he didn't waste time looking at these nebula while he was looking for comets and didn't have to see if they moved in the sky anymore because now he knows. And uh, we still use his, his catalog. Sometimes we'd, in the spring, there's a, a few days where you could do a Messier marathon if you really are sick enough to stay up all night and start as soon as you can possibly see something. You can do all 104 Messier object, 110, 110 uh, Messier objects in one night if you're really fortunate and, and don't get socked in with weather like this. Uh, that's just a close-up of, of the uh, Dumbbell Nebula just to show some of the detail there. This is a, a very cool and unusual uh, uh, planetary nebula. It's called the Cat's Eye Nebula. And uh, I, it really has scientists stumped. You can see these rings around it. And, and what they really are, are they are gas bubbles. And uh, what we're, the view here is like if we had sliced an onion in half, and then we looked at the, the rings. So we're looking through the, the bubble material to see these rings. And they look like they emitted, they were emitted at, at 1,500 year intervals. And um, we still don't know exactly what caused that. It's, it's a stumper. Um, each, of, each of those rings hold about 1% of the sun's mass, uh, which is still about the mass of all of the planets put together. And, and there's at least 11 of those. Um, so we're wondering, did, did the star pulse and, and put out these, these rings at, or bubbles at 1,500 year intervals, or did it just put out some ejecta and then there's some kind of magnetic force being uh, uh, at, at play here that's, that's after it's ejected, making it form into that ring structure. Uh, we don't know, but it's, it's, um, it really came as a surprise to, to scientists. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever know. We, every time we get a new telescope or higher technology, we learn a whole lot of more things that, that we didn't know about before. That's why I'm so excited to see what the James Webb scope is going to be teaching us. It's already, uh, it's already putting some theories to question, um, and we'll be, I'll be talking about that next month if if you want to uh, uh, stop by. I'll give you a, a James Webb 20 month update. This planetary nebula is known as Hubble's spirograph for obviously reasons, uh, obvious reasons. It's about 2,000 light years from us in the constellation Lepus. And the picture has been enhanced, as most of these pictures have, uh, so that you get some information from the color. So you see red is nitrogen, and uh, the green is hydrogen, the blue is ionized oxygen. Uh, so you can also tell what elements you're looking at as you're looking at a picture like that. So all of these planetary nebula started out similar to our sun, and then they became red giants. And after the, out after the outer atmosphere, was uh, drifted off what's left is called the white dwarf and uh, and it's so dense that approximately half the mass of the sun is packed into uh, a planet like earth right so ha so picture half of the mass of the sun packed into earth that's a very very dense object uh, a teaspoon probably weighs about a ton if you were able to pick up a teaspoon of it so stars with less than so eight solar masses, right, eight times the size of our sun or less, are sometimes called dwarf stars because they leave behind a dwarf. 
uh, because they leave out a dwarf star. <laughs> and uh, in this chart, we see all the dwarf stars are, are down here, and the white dwarfs are here. White dwarfs are hotter than, than the red dwarfs. The red dwarfs uh, never go through what I just explained to you as far as our sun. They, s they start out like, they're like slightly larger than the planet Jupiter, but they have enough gravity to ignite, but they burn very low and very slow. So they'll just sit there burning for what we think is billions or trillions of years. Whereas the white dwarf started out on the main sequence around here, and then went through, uh, went through the metamorphosis as it burned through its hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and, and carbon and such. So right now you, we can fit 1,300,000 planet Earths inside of the sun. So imagine the sun in less than one millionth of the space that it is currently in. Uh, that's just another way to, to look at how dense these white dwarfs are. And the white dwarfs are still hot. The ultraviolet and other wavelength radiation floods out into the gas shells that we were just looking at, causing them to fluoresce. So all those pretty colors and all that illumination that we saw in those planetary nebulas are all being powered by the radiation of those white dwarfs. And again, over a few thousand years, those gas shells will disperse and the white dwarfs will cool and fade away over uh, billions of years. Now, as we saw, there's, there's some stars that are a whole lot more massive than our sun, and they have different deaths than our sun would. For stars greater than eight times the sun mass, they won't experience that helium flash. They'll keep going on, fusing elements at their core. They won't stop when carbon and oxygen is formed. They'll stop when iron is formed. Iron is, is the death knell of, of the larger stars. But before they die, they can grow a thousand times the size of our sun, depending on how big those, those stars originally are. Um, and as we saw, the real big stars, they burn a lot faster than our sun. So they might burn uh, hydrogen for 10 million years, helium for a million years, carbon for a thousand years, until they get down to, um, to iron. Iron is the last stop for fusion. The reason is, is because um, for elements up to iron, um, they have less mass than their reactants, which means that they give off energy. When you get to iron, the product of iron fusion has more mass than the original reactants. And therefore, iron, does not, iron fusion does not create an energy. Instead, it requires the input of energy. And that's that's a big that that means as soon as we get some iron in a core, that's when we're going to see the demise of this star. And it's a very dramatic. What happens is that um, once iron's created, it only has minutes to live. It causes a chain reaction, core collapse. Uh, the iron fusion rate increases, the pressure decreases, the core collapses faster. Then the iron fusion rate increases pressure decreases and the core collapses faster and finally you get the the core collapses in itself and just explodes into a supernova and uh, a core collapse supernova a large quantity of neutrinos gets created in the reactions in the core at that time and the rebounding core and the newly created neutrinos go flying outward expelling outer layers of the star in a gigantic explosion and uh, to be precise it's called a type 2 or core collapse supernova. There's a, a lot of categories of supernova. As a matter of fact, we're learning so much about the evolution of stars that scientists really need to come up with a new classification for supernova, uh, except they just can't, dis can't, can't agree on, on a new classification. But there's a whole lot more than, than we used to think there were as far as supernova. So for a brief period of time, the amount of light generated by one star undergoing a supernova explosion is greater than the luminosity of a billion stars like the sun. Uh, these explosions are so bright that they're visible at immense di distances. The ex if a nearby star were to undergo a supernova explosion, we would be able to see it during the daytime. Um, 
that has never happened in modern history. But in modern history, we've had Tycho Brahe and Johann Kepler have observed naked eye supernova, uh, just not one that's visible during the day. In 1987, this supernova went off about 50,000 parsecs away from us, 163,000 light years, that is, or 960 quadrillion miles if you want to plan a road trip. Um, this is a picture taken by a ground-based telescope, and uh, it's an image of the supernova about two weeks after the explosion, and there's a supernova. Now, it just, film does not do the supernova justice as far as the brightness, because it just gets oversaturated with light, and then it, you can see it's a really bright object, but you have no idea that it's actually outshining the entire galaxy that, that it's sitting in. And uh, this was a this was an amazing time. There, I re remember reading a book, uh, nine, the 1968 A Supernova. That was its name, and it was just had everybody uh, excited because we never got to study a, a star going supernova with our with new scientific instruments, uh, you know, that close. This is a, a Hubble telescope picture. Hubble went up around 1990. Right, so a couple of years after the supernova, we had a Hubble telescope up there and it started taking pictures and started studying the evolution of, or the after effects uh, of the supernova. And if you look carefully in this picture, you could see that there's a shock wave leaving, heading towards that, that center ring. Um, that's a ring of matter encircling the, the exploded star. So super, supernova A uh, occurred in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a companion galaxy to the Milky Way. So it's pretty close, it's pretty close to us uh, as, as astronomical distances go. It's also the closest supernova to Earth that we've observed since the invention of the telescope. And now we had the Hubble Space Telescope up there looking at it uh, since 1990. And these are pictures that were taken uh, by the Hubble. And you could see the shock wave that was unleashed during the explosion was racing towards the ring. And just, just like a gas compresses under, under uh, gravity and ignites, the shock wave compresses the gas here and ignites it. And you can see how over time, and that's quite a, quite a, a long time from 1994 to 2016, but you can see how hot that ring of debris got as the shock wave pushed it and compressed it. So we see these hot spots uh, forming. They're still there. Um, and that elongated object in the middle there is, uh, is the ring of debris. It's not the ring of... It's in the middle of the ring. This here was um, debris from the supernova. The ring actually uh, was there before the star went supernova. Uh, they think that astron astronomers think that the star shed its ring about 20,000 years before the explosion. So about just like a sun-sized star shed some gas and, and became a planetary nebula, this star shed some, as it grew larger, it shed this ring. And uh, then when it went supernova, the shock wave from the explosion was now racing towards that and uh, and starting to compress it. And again, that that's about a light year across a, as well. Um, the elliptical shape of the supernova debris uh, provides clues to the violent events that took place deep within the exploding sun. Um, and uh, the, the debris is being he heated by radioactive elements uh, primarily titanium-44 that were created in the supernova explosion. So when a star explodes, a lot of elements are released into the universe, and that's how elements are made. As a matter of fact, when you look, now that we're being able to see younger and younger stars, we can tell a star is really young if it's mostly hydrogen and helium and lacks those elements that were later formed by a bunch of supernovas like this releasing those elements into the into the universe.
this is an artist's rendition of what a shock of what a shock wave uh, looks like during the explosion the supernova going off and the shock wave just going out of course it's matter so it doesn't travel at the speed of light that's why it takes so much time for that matter to reach that ring of ring uh, you know half a light what you're away now the supernova explosions like this up to about 80 times origin if the original star was up to about 80 times the size of our Sun so it's between 8 and 80 solar masses it's gonna leave behind what's known as a neutron star and a neutron star can have a mass greater than our Sun and be contained in an area of only about 12 miles so it's like all of the mass of the Sun contained in New York City in the in Manhattan I should say so the Sun weighs 333,000 times uh, more than Earth so imagine 166,000 Earths packed into the size of Manhattan just I, I mean it's just mind-blowing we're talking about a tiny star that's approximately a trillion times more dense than our Sun that's that's a neutrinos a neutron star a NASA article I read states that it's as dense as an atomic nucleus which is wild a and of course we saw a, a white dwarf is dense but it's nowhere near as dense as that here's a fo here's a Hubble photo of my favorite neutron star supernova revenant it's called the crab nebula Messier number one M1 and this is a mosaic image um, one of the largest ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope uh, it's six light years wide and it's expanding but what I really think is cool about this one is that Japanese and Chinese astronomers on the earth in the year 1054 saw this thing go off and it was bright enough to see during the daytime and we have their records of that and so when I when I look at this object with through a telescope it's just a, a fuzzy cloud but it's so cool to think that there were people on this planet who actually saw this thing go off and it was so bright they could look in the daytime and they could see a star in the sky and, uh, and for, for weeks unbelievable uh, the orange filaments are, are, are remains of uh, hydrogen um, the neutron star that's embedded in the middle of this and by the way it's it's illuminating this this entire six light year wide nebula um, th the blue light comes from the electrons whirling at nearly the speed of w light along the magnetic field lines of the neutron star and the neutron star is like a like a lighthouse so it's not only a trillion times denser than the Sun and packed in a 12 mile area but it's spinning at 30 times a second imagine Manhattan spinning at 30 times a second and the radiation come is is, uh, is bipolar so it shoots out both sides and as it spins it gives out pulses and that's why we call these objects pulsars um, so neutron stars is, is crushed ultra dense core of an exploded star spinning around in this case 30 times a second some spin a lot faster than that this picture I just found uh, recently it was just released in August of uh, 2022 it's an image of the crab nebula from three different spectrum the visible light is from the Hubble Space Telescope and is purple the x-ray light is from the Chandra x-ray observatory in blue and infrared light from the Spitzer Space Telescope is in red and the crab pulsar as is the, as the neutron star is known uh, is the bright spot right there that's the first time I, I I've seen little specks but this is when I first saw this on the website I thought this was an artist's rendition I, I really didn't think that this was taken through space telescopes it's amazing uh, it's just an amazing picture and as I said it just came out in uh, August of last year so there's a lot more I could say about neutron stars let me see how we're doing on time here um, but I'm gonna let you look online if you want to explore that 
my hope in doing these talks is really to get a few people interested enough to to go online and, and look there's nothing that i'm showing you here that you can't find on the on the nasa site the hubble site uh the james webb there's all kinds of resources out there and you can learn so much uh so much by going through those sites and the cool thing is unlike star wars this stuff is real <laughs> it's weirder than star wars and it's actually real so when you're spending time looking through this stuff you're learning science you're learning about reality some of these neutron stars will sp will spin uh over 700 times a second faster than the blades in your blender and uh if you look around you can find the black widow pulsar which is uh, a pulsar that has a companion brown dwarf and it's slowly sucking the life out of it <laughs> sucking the gases out of it uh as as it goes through space there's just all kinds of strange objects out there, and, and I really encourage you to, to do a little looking yourself. Start off with NASA or the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and, and see what they've got, the Hubble space photos. And, and James Webb now is, is amazing. So just a, a little recap. We would, all of our stars form in a stellar nebula. The gas clouds collapse. They form a protostar after about 100,000 years, give or take. They ignite in, into, well, they, they fuse. Nuclear fusion occurs when they become a protostar. They reach hydrostatic equilibrium in about 100,000 years, and then they spend their life on the main sequence. The bigger stars living a lot less than the smaller stars. And so an average star under eight solar masses, like our sun, spends about 10 billion give or take years on the main sequence until it runs out of hydrogen becomes a red giant ends up with a planetary nebula half of its shell half of its mass in a shell and then finally a white dwarf is left behind for stars larger than eight times the sun we have a massive star that becomes a red supergiant after it hits iron in its core we see it collapse in itself and explode into a spectacular supernova. Up to about 80 solar masses, give or take. There's a whole lot of qualifications on that, but it's a, it's a good rule of thumb. From 8 to 80, you got a neutron star. Over 80, you're going to be left with a black hole there. So that's a very oversimplified uh, life cycle of a star. Here's a, some guy nerded it up a little bit, added a few more, added the brown dwarf, which just sits there by itself. Uh, what he did here is he, you have the red giant turns into a planetary nebula, but some red giants uh, have a binary with a white dwarf, and the white dwarf starts sucking all the, the gas off the red giant till it gets big enough to have a type 1a supernova. And so there's there's many different permutations, and there's all kinds of ways to to illustrate it, and and we don't have time to to get into the uh, uh, real deeper science, and I don't have the brain to do that either. Uh, here's another another fellow put the star forming nebula right here in the middle, and the massive star is branching out this way, and and the smaller star is that way. It's the same information, but it's just a different way of of presenting it, which I. I find uh, pretty uh, amazing. So this is an artist's rendition of a black hole. And a, a black hole is is so massive, right? As we, as we said, it's got to be over 80 solar masses even to, to form up. So it's, it's so massive that it, light itself can't escape from it. And so we can't really see a black hole, but we can see how it warps the very space-time around it. And Einstein predicted this uh, many years ago, but our science now is confirming his predictions in a bunch of different ways, which which we're going to take a look at. But they're so fab, they're so massive, they bend the fabric of space and time. Um, I, I've seen it said that if you do the math, and 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 you were able to compress our sun down to a black hole dem density it would be about six kilometers in diameter. So it would be about three miles around if we were to able to turn the sun into a black hole. And of course, the black hole, uh, the sun is 1.4 million kilometers across now. So from 1.4 million 
to six kilometers is, is the relative density if we turn the sun into a black hole. Now, a few years ago, in 2017, we actually were able to get what newspapers were saying is a photograph of a black hole. But as I said, you can't actually photograph a black hole. But what we can do is we can photograph the accretion disk. Let me just get that. We can photograph the accretion disk because an, a black hole is so massive, it sucks any gas or particles um, into it. And so as they, as they spiral into the black hole, they heat up. And we can get, or we have gotten, a picture of that accretion disk. So what we're really seeing is the silhouette of a black hole here and the matter that's being gobbled up by it swirling around and, and getting really hot and, uh, and, and falling into it. So that was, uh, that, that, was uh, that really made the news. You probably, you probably saw that in the newspapers back a few years ago. That's the home of the black hole that we saw. Now, we believe black holes are at, in the center of most galaxies, but this one we were able to photograph is a pretty boring looking uh, uh, elliptical galaxy. It's not nearly as pretty as the Milky Way with the arms. It's just kind of a, a blobby thing. But, uh, and it's in the constellation Virgo uh, about uh, 53 million light years away. But that's the home of the, the black hole that we were able to, uh, to get a picture of. Now, one of the cool effects that we can see from black holes is called gravitational lensing. And what that is is very, very massive objects, again, galaxies with black holes in them, that are bending the fabric of space-time. Sometimes we see an object directly behind it, like another galaxy, where the lens, the lensing effect of the gravity brings it out to the side, and we can actually see it. So here's an example. You see this 90-degree this arc? That's a galaxy that's actually behind that cluster of galaxies. Those, that cluster of galaxies is about 5 billion light years away from us. And this galaxy that's being lensed, it's being magnified, but also very much distorted in image, that's 10 billion light years. So it's 5 billion light years behind that galaxy cluster that's doing the gravitational lensing. It just amazing stuff. Um, Here's gravitational lensing creating what they call an Einstein cross. And, and when I saw this, this, this is an old, older photo, probably about 10 years. It's Hubble. Um, the, bo oh, the box is an enlargement of, of this area. Super massive uh, galaxy here. And what this is, is one supernova, one star behind it went supernova. And the lensing effect enabled us to see that one supernova in four different instances in time around that. Just uh, amazing. You know, the, when Hubble first went up, they used to point it at um, what we thought were blank, blank areas in the sky. And then we'd be amazed that we'd see like 1,600 galaxies that we never knew even existed there. After they got through that, they started pointing it at really crowded parts of the sky. And they started seeing stuff like this, gravitational lensing, uh, Einstein's uh, cross, just amazing stuff um, showing up. So in, in addition to giving us a closer look at the dynamics of this distant supernova, uh, the team says that its discovery will help pr improve our understanding of the distribution of dark matter in the lensing galaxy and the galaxy cluster, as well as to test Einstein's general theory of relativity and measure the rate of cons cosmic expansion in the universe. And that's, that's an ongoing controversy, is how fast is our universe expanding? And is it speeding up? Is the expansion of the universe speeding up or not? And we're looking at all these different types of new discoveries to see if there's some way we can calibrate them to help us understand how fast our universe is expanding and at, at what rate. This is another Einstein cross. This time it's of a distant quasar. It's not a supernova. Uh, it's an extremely bright galactic nucleus. 
Uh, they're thought to be powered by supermassive black holes ranging from millions to tens of billions of solar masses. And the, the, when we first discovered them, we didn't have the Hubble telescope, and so quasar, what was meant to stand for a quasi-star. Scientists knew it wasn't a star, but they had no idea what it was, so they named these objects quasars. The lensing galaxy here is about 400 million light years away, and the quasar that we see in the cross is about 8 billion light years away, almost two-thirds of the age of the universe away. Right? Because when we say something's 8 billion light years away, we're traveling back in time there. It means that the light we're seeing from these quasars is 800 billion years old, right? Because it took 800 billion years to get here. And when we see the galaxy in the middle is 400 million light years away, that's how the galaxy looked 400 million years ago. At the University of, of Chicago website, I found an article on how astronomers there propose to use pairs of black holes that are colliding to try to measure how fast our universe is expanding. So here's another way. They said, basically, you know, these things are producing gravitational waves, and they call it the spectral siren. Um, and this is a, this is an artist rendition, by the way. It's not it's not a, a anything any photograph. It's just a rendition of it. But when black holes collide, they give off gravitational waves. And we have two observatories that detect these gravitational waves: the U U.S. Observatory LIGO and uh, and the Italian Observatory uh, Virgo. And and so they're looking at a way of trying to figure out if if they can calibrate those gravitational waves uh, and use it to figure out the expansion of, of the universe because it just requires using Einstein's theory of gravity rather than the, the current method is very calculation intensive. And if you make a, a slight error in one calculation, you can, you can be far off. And so they think that we're going to get a better accuracy by using these gravitational waves off, off of uh, colliding black holes. Only time's going to tell. One last star. This is star HD 140283, or at least that's the location of it, right here. It's in the constellation Libra, right on the border of Ophicius. Um, and it's one of the oldest stars in the universe. It's made primarily of hydrogen as he and helium. As I mentioned to you, the, the lack of heavier metals gives an indication that this really is an old star. Uh, it's about 190 light years from Earth in the, in that con in the constellation Libra. Um, since it's magnitude 7.2, there is a chance of you seeing that in your binoculars under dark skies. And uh, it's nicknamed the Methuselah star, which is the oldest person in, in the Bible in the Old Testament. I guess he lived 960 years old or something. So they've named it after him and they called it Methusia. But the weird, really weird thing about this is that scientists measure its age at 14.3 billion years, give or take 800 million years. That's older than the universe, right? And, and, and they've, they've honed down their calculations. But even, even a more conservative calculation still puts it over 14 billion years old. Um, and the star is moving at about 800,000 miles an hour. So to make a long story short, there's a bunch of uncertainties involved in the calculation, but even revised age estimates put this star at an age greater than the universe. And the star has been used by some scientists to call the whole theory of the Big Bang Theory uh, into question. And uh, I just present this at the end to show that, you know, scientists are always evaluating their theories and their hypotheses with fresh data. And as we put s new telescopes up, like the James Webb Telescope, we learn stuff that really make us rethink some of our theories. And, you know, sometimes I, I hear on social media someone will say, trust the science, as is the case is closed. That's the most unscientific thing you can say because you should always be testing your hypotheses. Well, sure, if, if you're talking to a person who believes the Earth is flat, maybe you want to point them to some scientific observations. That's kind of a case closed. But, but there's a lot of stuff out there that we're still not sure if we've got the theory right. 
because new data is coming in all the time. And every time we come up with new technology, it lets us see further back into time uh, within a couple hundred million years of the beginning of the universe. And so it's a very exciting time. Uh, come back and we'll talk about what scientists are learning on the James Webb Telescope. But uh, that's it for me. It looks like most of you are still awake, <laughs> and I really appreciate that. All right. Thank you so much, Walt. Thank you for everyone who's... Once again, I have to be mindful of that speaker since it's uh, throwing a fit today. So before we get into question and answer, I am going to go over the safety briefing because I know a couple of you snuck in after the fact. If you need to use the bathroom in your hair, you do have the porta potty in the back. Uh, it's lit by the red light. It's off to my left, so it's your right. Uh, on that same note to my left, or your right, I have the door outlined in red there. It contains a museum slash gift shop, so do feel free to check that out. I'll be in there after a question and answer session. When we leave, we use our headlights. We do not like getting run over, and I am sure you feel the same. Uh, other than that, uh, do listen to the directions of our volunteers. If you have any questions, they're also a great resource to ask answer any of those questions so for question and answer session because it is dark today uh keep in mind I hello i am like a t-rex my vision is based on movement so if you're here you're gonna wave your hand in the air just like you don't care uh and keep that up because otherwise i will lose you in the dark uh you will speak i'll bring you out the mic because chances are, if you have a question, our online audience also wants to know the answer or has the same question and is just too shy to ask. With that being said, we're going to start off with our first online question, which is, even though the models we have are very much heliocentric, doesn't it make more sense to build off what we know rather than to try and solve for unknowns and hypotheticals that we don't know about right off the bat? I'm not really sure what you're getting at, but you know, you, as far as having solar mass I being think one that was and during, the luminosity being one. Yeah, I think that was during the um, the uh, magnitude chart where yeah. one is one like, is the sun. Yeah, ab absolutely. It it helps us better relate to what we're talking about. So one solar mass, we know what the mass of the sun is, and so to use that as a basis for understanding of the rest of the universe certainly makes sense. Uh, right. Questions out here. Everyone went really still, except for a couple who escaped off to the observatories, which has the telescopes. <laughs> Nothing? Just crickets? Oh, yeah, you have to move it around, otherwise I can't nice. see it. <laughs> I had a question about the, uh, the very old star. So if it was older than the universe, does that mean that it was around before the Big Bang Theory? Because I, I heard that you were saying how the star was kind of contradicting the Big Bang Theory? Some scientists have said, I mean, one or two things is true. Number one, we don't understand that star enough to, to properly date it, or we have to really think about the Big Bang Theory or the age of the universe. Something's not jiving, and, and we don't know what, what it is yet. Uh, they're, they're still discovering that, but it's gotta be one of those. The age of the universe is, is off, the age of Methuselah is off, or maybe the Big Bang Theory is needs to be rethunk. Yeah. All right. So our next online question, and yes, I was right about the um, that w first question was about magnitude because the second question has to do with planets. Do we know if any of the gas giants have a solid core? You were showing know. Jupiter. Right. <laughs> yeah, I I was showing Jupiter. I, I know that's the wonderful thing about my talks is I go so many different places. The questions can come from any direction. And uh, no, I'm not sure about that. But I'm sure a quick Google, I hate to do that, but a quick Google will uh, will get that through. I don't think there is, but I'm not sure. I know Dan has been watching. Maybe he'll supply me with an answer on that one. Hey, Dan. Was there another question out here? Oh, perfect. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the University of Chicago was studying two black holes that are getting very close to each other. So 
what would happen when those black holes like collided with each other? They send out a whole bunch of neutrinos and, and uh, gravitational, uh, gravitational waves. And it's the gravitational waves that, uh, that they hope to uh, catalog and, and then uh, uh, use as, as references. And, and actually, they've got, um, uh, they've got data from about, I think it's 40 or 50 different pairs of black holes and, and collisions already. And so they're looking to normalize that data and see what they can get glee from that stuff. All right. Well, so our next online question is, if the Earth's sun is a yellow giant, why does it look white to us? I think they're talking about, like, looking directly at the sun, which, Ooh, by the way, do you that. shouldn't don't do. do. That. Don't do that, please. <laughs> Especially in a telescope. Never do that. Uh, you know, it, it does look yellow. I mean, if, if you look... It, it looks yellow. Uh, if if you um, if you're into photography, you know that sunlight will cast a, a yellow, what they call a warm color temperature. Uh, so it does. I, I I always thought it looked yellow. So maybe uh, maybe you see it, see it as white. It's awful bright. Yeah, sometimes uh, brightness can override some color receptors. There, I For believe. Sure. Make you sneeze too. All right, I saw a hand waving frantically. There we go. <laughs> uh, when you were talking about the uh, Einstein cross, you mentioned that the black hole was showing at, at four different uh, point in time. The supernova, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, w what causes that difference in time, and how far apart are those time periods uh, it, they're they're very close together i couldn't give you an, an exact they're very close together but what causes the time is that each light each each of those images have tr has traveled a, a slightly different light path around that massive uh, galaxy cluster and so it might arrive a second or two before the other one or a split second and that's why you see a slight differential in, in size because there's a very slight difference uh, in the timing of them traversing their way around that, that massive cluster. They took four different ways to get there. Mm -hmm. It's like me when I'm uh, trying to plot a route to work and I'm like, I have four ways to get here. Which one's the fastest? <laughs> All right, so our next online question is, is an Earth-like planet possible around some of the extra large stars? So like Antares and larger. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. It's possible that Antares can grow out uh, to meet one. But usually what happens is you have a solar system, an extra so solar system, and by the time Antares is getting big, it's, it's, swallowed that, it's swallowed it up. But there are planets that go out far enough. Like if you had a system with a red giant or a star going to red giant and there's a planet the, the distance of Pluto, well, yeah, you can have a star like Antares and Pluto will still be untouched. It might even have beachfront property in a while. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's possible. All right. Another question from out here? Oh, perfect. So earlier you mentioned that around something uh, Chinese and Japanese astronomers, astronomers also, they notice the another star object during the daytime, right? So do you experience same kind of um, another star during daytime in present time? No. Not not since not in modern times has we, have we seen a supernova in daylight. That's the last time that we know of was a thousand almost a thousand years ago. Uh, certainly potential, yeah. I mean, they talk about the, uh, a couple of years ago there was a, a lot of hype about Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is going to go supernova sooner or later, and uh, that would be pretty spectacular. Yeah, I I feel like if there was one visible in the day. A, we would notice, and B, the news uh, channels would be all over it, and your friend would be going, hey, have you heard the news? So I, I think you're yeah. safe. it's safe to say uh, we would have heard about it if one happened to start. All right. So our next online question. What happens when a white dwarf completely cools? Like, it, it's a rock? Uh, what, what does it classify as They then? call it a black dwarf. Yeah, when it's when it's totally cooled. I mean, we have. I don't think. I don't think we've we've seen it. We we've, we've got those brown dwarfs, but they were, they were always, you know, cooler stars. But yeah, the white will cool off into a black dwarf. 
Dan and, had actually and answered we, we, that, and I wasn't sure if he was pulling my leg. So no, and, <laughs> I, and you know, they they may be out there, but how are you going to see them? <laughs> it's almost like a black dwarf. They're very tiny. I mean, like a black hole. They're very tiny, and uh, and they don't emit any light. All right. Another question from out here. All right. So we just have a couple of questions left for online. So if online people, if you have any last minute questions, do get those in. Uh, the next one, if you could take iron from a dying star, would it be good iron to make a sword out of? <laughs> I guess it would. I mean, uh, iron that would falls on a planet. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I, mean, I don't think any of us are uh, well versed in metallurgical properties of. Well, you'd have to let it cool down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Man, it, tr try the quench on that one at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a long distance. Uh, better off just digging. All right. So another. The second to last question. Uh, did you get to see the supernova in M101 recently? I think it's 101. Yeah, I, I, I saw some pictures of it. Yeah, I did not go out and observe it. And have you ever personally done any astrophotography of some of the objects you've shown tonight? I have. And uh, I, I used to do it back in the, in the film days. And uh, digital photography has made it so much easier than, uh, than back in the film days where you had to do 45-minute exposures and guide the exposure the whole time. Now you can take a bunch of one-minute exposures and use Photoshop to stack those ex exposures. So yeah, I've, I've taken some pretty cool astro photos. Uh, I photoed, photographed uh, Comet Hale Bop here back in uh, 97, which is an amazing sight. All uh, right, so before I get to the last online question that I see, is there last chance for out here? Perfect. So what's the reason for having to take um like minute exposures why can't you just take like a s quick shot of something in space you could you want to you want to at least have enough data on your image to, to stack it you could take shorter ones but one minute two minute images are, are the best you know th then you can do like 30 or 60 of those stack them and and uh, come up with something very nice and colorful There's uh, a good you, photography is all about light collection. So if you are, for example, consider your camera as a bucket and the light is water coming out of a hose. If you just like quickly the hose over the bucket, you don't have a lot of water. You're not going to be able to do very much with the water in the bucket. So you want to kind of fill that bucket with as much light as you can with good light you want it to be able to reduce noise so you're going to want to hold the hose over the bucket a little longer so you can get you know a usable amount of water but you could if you have a wide angle lens uh, you know the whole thing is, is the earth is rotating so if you take a depending on the lens if you have a like a telephoto lens you got to take a much shorter exposure before the star makes a streak than a wide angle. But if you had a wide angle lens and you took a picture of the Milky Way for 30 or 40 seconds, you would be able to see galaxies in there. They wouldn't be as as amazing as some of these these shots uh, or even some of the regular astrophotography shots, but you'd be able to pick out different objects in that photograph of the Milky Way. And there's this uh, app called PILS, P-I-L-S, that will tell you when the Milky Way is over certain land objects. And you could set up a tripod and try it with a wide angle lens if you just want to get get your feet wet in astrophotography yeah. uh, without buying a, 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 a astro tracker or something like that. Uh, also, if you want to use the shorter exposures, a lot of times you take multiple of those uh, s shorter exposures and then squish them all together, which will help you reduce noise. But just like if you're taking a picture of a flower or whatnot, you'll notice the longer you leave that shutter open, the brighter the image can be. So if you don't leave it open long enough, you might just have a just black slide. If, course, if that helps you. Of course, open your aperture and shoot at ISO 1600 or 3200 and uh, try it, you know. 
Doesn't cost anything. <laughs> Just a little time. All right. So any other last minute questions out here? All right. So our last online question is actually more of just a funny can light go stale like bread because apparently we're getting 80 800 billion year old light up here <laughs> i'm not touching that one <laughs> <laughs> all right so with that i want to thank everyone who has joined us here on on site and also online uh do hit those like and subscribe buttons if you're online if you're here hit them those like and subscribe buttons anyway when you get a chance it does help us uh, know that what we are doing is what you want to see uh again check us out on our website uacnj.org and feel free to ask any questions there we have uh, contact info on the website and until then have a good night yeah thanks a lot and